I have introduced our speaker tonight so many times, I always try to do it a little bit differently. So here goes. I can't remember a time in my profession, and I've been in it many decades, that I didn't know Dr. Graham Lee. I think I knew him before I got my PhD, and he has uh, he has never changed in his um, appearance as one of the true gentlemen in our profession. Uh, it has been an honor and a pleasure to work with him on various projects. Uh, for my money, he is the nation and the world's expert on the church-state relations in the United States, the legal aspects of that. When he taught at St. Joseph's University, he's an emeritus professor there. He spent his entire career teaching at St. Joseph's. He taught an entire 14 or 15-week term dealing with um, freedom of religion. He was using a massive two-volume edition of, of cases. They were long cuttings of cases, and in those, in those days, students read and analyzed those cases. And when I first met him, the Burger Court was going back and forth about the nature of parochial school aid from the state and, and the evolving nature of the wall of separation between church and state. Uh, we have, over the decades, seen the rise and then the fall and then the rise again of the free exercise of religion uh, protection by the Supreme Court. And um, he is the person who trained me in this area. Every year, as I am beginning to teach this subject of uh, church-state relations, free exercise of religion, and the establishment of religion, I am always uh, interested in talking to Dr. Lee about ways to interpret the tests, ways to interpret the cases. And now I need him more than ever. Fortunately, next week, we start our religion cases for five weeks. He's going to do it in an hour. That's going to be uh, interesting to watch. I get five weeks to try to explain it to my class. And uh, he is a he is a, a multi-book author on free exercise and establishment of religion, and also the opinions of William Howard Taft. Uh, he was the dean of uh, of the University College of Graduate Programs at St. Joseph University, uh, graduate of Penn, and uh, really has done a lot of public service and a lot of public education in this area. So I'm very much looking forward to listening to him and to learning from him. Graham, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us tonight. Thank you, Bruce, for that very gracious introduction. You know, in today's world, uh, th that politician who can really use a teleprompter well is probably the, the best speaker. But you know they're using a teleprompter. Well, Bruce is obviously following the script that I sent him, but he can do it so graciously that you think it's it's original. I mean, it's really just wonderful. Thank you very much, Bruce. And, and the check that I included along with the with the transcript, don't cash that until I get the check from the Rendell Center. It a bounce, okay? And speaking of the Rendell Center, I want to thank immediately Beth Specker for being being the technical whiz here. Uh, PowerPoint is certainly not my uh, my forte. Uh, when I retired, as Bruce said, I did retire. I retired when they took out, took down the blackboards at St. Joseph's University. I knew with with them gone, it was time for me to go. But I also want to thank Beth for inviting me back to talk about religion and politics. I mean, in our very divided society where you can get into an argument with your best friend very quickly when you start talking about politics. So start talking about religion and politics is really very dangerous business. I just got back from a trip and the last dinner, my wife and I sat with two other couples and somehow one of the members of the group, an American, brought up the issue of church and state. And I engaged with the conversation and it, it got going, it got going and got going. Luckily, there was this nice couple from Canada there and Canadians are so nice. And so the wife uh, brought out her cell phone and sat talking about her grandchildren. And that ended the conversation, thank God, because otherwise it was going downhill very quickly. The idea of religion and politics, bringing these two together, clearly starts conflicts. In terms of American society today, it's surprising Given all the divisions, all the debate over abortion, over gun control, we don't really hear much about religion and politics. 
Certainly hasn't been that in the past. In the past, clearly, that was an issue that divided Americans. If you go back to the period after the Civil War, with, after, with Irish immigration, the development of Catholic schools, uh, the Blaine Amendment was proposed basically by, urged by w- President Grant. It was not adopted, but most states adopted a, what was called a mini Blaine Amendment to spell out exactly that you could not give money to religious schools. The Cincinnati Bible Wars uh, over whether Bibles should, by, there should be Bible reading, reading, uh, reading in public schools was a, was a controversy. It involved Chief Justice William Howard Taft's father ruled in that case. More recently, debates over aid to, to parochial schools became a real political issue. And yet today it, sounds, it doesn't seem to get much attention. Free exercise also has gotten a great deal of attention on a lot of controversy. But again, not so much recently. I mean, the last term of the Supreme Court, a tumultuous term, where you had the, the decision in terms of abortion, the Hobbes decision, you had a decision on guns, but they got a lot of publicity, very little publicity. In fact, you can hardly see any was devoted to the two cases involving religion, Carson versus Macon and Kennedy versus the Bremerton School District. The two important cases I uh, suggest or try to, uh, to make clear in a few minutes, but they got no attention. Everyone was talking about the overturning of a 50 year precedent, Roe versus Wade, but Lemon versus Kurtzman, a, a decision of 53 years, got no attention. And it pretty much got ignored by the Supreme Court, Supreme Court in these two decisions, particularly Carson versus Macon. I mean, you could say that Lemon versus Kurtzman and Employment versus Smith are, are the two cases. They're the Roger Dangerfield cases. They get no respect. They get nothing. But these are the two precedents in terms of the First Amendment, or what the first, how the court has, has looked at, at the, the First Amendment. The first of them is Lemon versus Kurtzman. So we have a, a, a the, the case, yeah. This is a decision by the Burger Court handed down in 1971. It involved an effort by both Pennsylvania and Rhode Island to try to provide some support to religious schools and particularly, uh, or most of them being Catholic schools. It would to subsidize the the salaries of teachers as I'm sure everyone uh, on this program would agree. If you pay us better, we can teach better. And so that was what the states of Pennsylvania and Rhode Island tried to do in Lemon versus Kurtzman. The court, however, struck it down as unconstitutional. And in striking it down, set forth what's called the Lemon Test. Three such tests may be gleaned from our cases. First, the statute must have a secular legislative purpose. Secondly, its primary or principal or primary effect must be one that neither advances nor inhibits religion. And thirdly, finally, the statute must not foster an excessive government entanglement religion. That's the lemon test. That's the establishment clause taste the court established in 1971. On free exercise, the standard is employment division versus Smith. We have the employment division versus Smith case. Beth? Employment Division versus Smith is a case handed down by the, the Rehnquist Court by, and re- authored by Justice Scalia. Rehnquist, the case stated it involved a individual, several individuals. One of them was a drug counselor, but a Native American, and he used peyote. Uh, he lost his job. He applied for unemployment. And the court says, no, you don't get unemployment, said Scalia. We have never held that an individual's religious beliefs excuse them from compliance with an otherwise valid law prohibiting conduct that the state is free to regulate. The only decisions in which we have held that the First Amendment bars application of a neutral, generally applicable law to religiously motivated action have involved not the free exercise clause alone, but the free exercise clause in conjunction with other constitutional protections, such as freedom of speech and of the press. We have never invalidated any government action on the basis of Sherbet versus Vanna, except the denial of unemployment compensation. Well, these two precedents, Employment Division versus Smith and Lemon versus Kurtzman, were very much in the background of the two cases decided in the court of the last term, Carson versus Macon and Bramerton versus Kennedy. And yet, do they stand? 
Does Lemon still, is Lemon still a president? It's two years older than Roe versus Wade. The dissenters in Carson versus Macon says it's gone, but it hasn't been explicitly overturned. Why these cases don't get more attention, why the court's changes don't get more attention. I mean, obviously the case of the court's change in abortion is dramatic. It became a political issue, one that had a great deal of impact in the, the mid recent midterm elections. But these cases, nothing. And as I say, it's not like disputes over free exercise or establishment don't surface and don't become political. But for some reason, they don't. When you have a nomination of a justice to the Supreme Court, they want to know where that justice is going to stand on abortion. They want to know where they stand on the Second Amendment. But these, no one seems to ask a question. It's almost as if the senators on the Judiciary Committee have taken to heart Emily Post's recommendation that you shouldn't talk about politics and religion. They don't say a word. It's unbelievable. Because the court's changes, and I'll make clear later this, this evening, have been dramatic. Where the court stands today with regard both to free exercise and to the non-establishment clause is 180 degrees change from its previous position. That brings us to the First Amendment. In one sense, the First Amendment is pretty clear. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or the press or the right of the people peacefully to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. It was an interview in 1969 that Justice Hugo Black said, look, I learned, I forget whether it was grade two or three, from the teacher, my teacher in grade two, that no means no. No law means no law. And the court, through the process of incorporation, has carried over these guarantees, freedom of speech, freedom of the press, prohibition against the establishment of religion, prohibition of limiting free exercise onto the states as well. That's very clear. No law means no law. And if you look at the court's precedents, decisions in terms of speech and press, it's pretty much an absolute guarantee. But when you come to these, there's a different issue. We can decide what freedom of speech is, we can debate a little bit about freedom of press. Uh, I'll put in a footnote from my former employer, one graduate of St. Joseph's University, Justice McKenna, was the person who's, who interpreted the guarantee of freedom of press to also include uh, movies. They're pretty clear. And as I say, today, they're pretty much absolutes. But when you come to free exercise or establishment, what do they mean? What is an establishment of religion? What's free exercise? What are the limits to this? And the court in trying to come to a conclusion has had problems. Even Justice Black, who sees freedom of press and freedom of speech as very clear, could not come down with a one word answer about what an establishment of religion is. In the famous case of Everson versus Board of Education, the case involving the 1947 case, which incorporated the establishment clause onto the states. A case, a case involving the provision of reimbursement two parents for, the, for their children who went to religious schools. The court said that was constitutional, but what's the standard? Well, Black had to go much further than just no law. Instead, he has a definition that goes on for about 12 or 13 lines. The establishment of religion clause of the first amendment means at least this, neither a state nor the federal government can set up a church, neither can cast, pass laws which aid one religion and aid all religions, or prefer one religion over another, neither can force nor influence persons to go or to remain away from church against his will or force him to profess a belief or disbelief in any religion. No person may be punished for entertaining or professing religious beliefs or disbeliefs for church attendance or non-attendance. No tax in any amount, large or small, can be levied to support any religious activities or institutions, whatever they be. And it continues for about four or five more lines, trying to define what is an establishment of religion. Well, the problem that Black faced in 1947 is a problem that continues to, to, to burden the court in subsequent years. And the court has tried to come up with different tests, different standards. You have the lemon standard, the lemon test, which is essentially a composite of three other cases. Of the Everson case as a secular purpose, Abington Township versus Shemp really started the primary effect test. The other case that's, that's, that is mentioned 
there in terms of Lemon versus Kurtzman, Board of Education versus Allen. And finally, the Waltz case, a case involving a tax exemption of church property. It, it is head of all of these. Free exercise also poses a problem. What is free exercise of religion? Does it mean, you know, uh, sati, uh, the Hindu practice that when the, the husband dies, he's put on the funeral pyre, his corpse, and the wife has to join him? What is free exercise of religion? Those are problems, but there are also problems in terms of some, what some people perceive as a conflict between the non-establishment clause and the free exercise clause. In one famous free exercise case, Sherbert versus Vanna, Sherbert versus Vanna involved a Seventh-day Adventist who was discharged from her job, let go from her job because of lack of work in terms of the, of the, of the mills. She applied for unemployment compensation. And as I would always tell my students, first of all, you have to have a job before you can get it. And you have to make yourself available for work. Well, Sherpa said, I'm, I'm willing to go back, but I can't work on a Saturday. The South Carolina statute says you don't have to make yourself available Sunday, but you had to work on Saturday. Well, the Supreme Court said that is a violation of the free exercise clause, just as Brennan wrote the opinion. But in dissent, Justice Harlan, John Marshall Harlan said, there's a problem here. You're giving a preference to Sherbet for religion. That's an establishment of religion. There's a conflict here. This issue of a conflict Chief Justice Berger talked about and said between the free exercise clause and the establishment clause, you have to have a little bit of play on the joints, a rather vague terminology here. You know, what they're saying, the conflict, you know, it's one thing to, to criticize James Madison for being a slaveholder. But James Madison is the author of the Bill of Rights. He played a major role in the framing of what we call the First Amendment. You mean James Madison didn't know what he was doing? He set up a conflict between these two? I mean, since we're talking about religion, that's almost heresy. You could be burnt for that one. I mean, James Madison certainly knew what he was doing. When you look at the cases that have come down, largely they've been cases up until recently in terms of the non-establishment clause case. If, if any of you took constitutional law, uh, your casebook probably had three times as many pages devoted to the non-establishment clause as the free exercise clause. It's, it would seem to be the more important. But when you look at the language, what is the purpose? It's not just a member of the Federalist Society or the majority of justices on the present court would say it has to be religious liberty. Lawrence Tribe would argue that of Harvard Law School. Akio Amar of, of Yale Law School says it's religious liberty. So what is religious liberty? How do we define it? And how, as a justice, do you put it into practice? I would suggest to you, whether consciously or unconsciously, the justices of the Supreme Court start to take a particular position in terms of their understanding of religious liberty. They take a, a, a very different, a definite position based on their votes on free exercise, their votes on establishment. And so we can categorize them as either communitarians, separationists, secularists, or accommodations. We could have the, the, uh, the, the chart here, yeah. I, I, my math is pretty bad. I was trying to look it up, the x-axis or the y-axis, but I don't think that would be very wise of me to try. So I would talk about north-south and east-west. The, the north-south talks about how the justices react to a case or issue challenges a violation of the Establishment Clause. At the top, constitutional. The bottom, unconstitutional. Where do they go? Where are they justices who basically never find a law that uh, violates the establishment clause, such as Justice White or Justice Scalia? Or are they on the opposite, someone like uh, Justice Douglas, who never found something that wasn't unconstitutional? Free exercise, the east-west uh, axis here, do they find for the individual who finds that his or her free exercise of religion has been violated, or do they find uh, that the government has a right to do that? Okay. So those, those are your four positions. So an accommodations justice is a justice who's likely to find that a law challenged under the Establishment Clause is constitutional, but when a law is challenged under, under free exercise, they're likely to find it to be unconstitutional. 
At the opposite, on the opposite side, the secularist is the justice who's going to uphold laws challenged as a violation of the free exercise, but find laws challenged under the Establishment Clause as unconstitutional. The communitarian is going to vote in favor of laws that are challenged under the Establishment Clause. They're also going to uphold laws challenged as a violation of free exercise. And finally, the separationist is the justice who's likely to rule for the individual and free exercise clause cases against the government in non-establishment clause cases. And to put some, some uh, flesh on these bones, let's take a look at uh, particular justices and where they stand on this. Justice O'Connor, very much an accommodationist. Scalia, a communitarian. Frankfurter, a secularist. Brennan, a separationist. And finally, let's look at the particular courts and where they would be. The old court was very much communitarian. I mean, the first case involving free exercise, the case of Reynolds versus United States, the polygamy case, the Supreme Court said, no, you're doing it based on your free exercise. You believe it's your duty to take multiple wives. That's fine and dandy, but we can't do it. Free exercise only protects belief. And a subsequent decision by the, by the old court on, in terms of polygamy said, not only can you be prosecuted for practicing polygamy, but even if you believe in polygamy, you can be denied the vote. In terms of establishment, the old court, uh, the case of Holy Trinity, uh, the Holy Trinity case, the court proclaimed, Justice Brewer proclaimed, we are a Christian nation. That's communitarian. The Warren Court, the latter, latter Warren Court, when it, after the Sherbet decision, definitely falls in the category of being separations. It looked askance at attempts to age religion in terms of religious schools. It struck down Bible reading prayers in public schools, but also was a little bit more protective of free exercise. The, the secularist column, I almost, I'm tempted to put the Burger Court there. Because the Burger Court, even though it was the hope of Richard Nixon when he appointed Warren Burger and Harry Blackman and Lewis Powell and William Rehnquist to change matters on establishment, it didn't work out. Uh, some people would, would, would say that the fault left, uh, lay with Ch Chief Justice Burger, who was neither a great task leader or social leader and really didn't control his court. It might be a, a secularist court because it also cut back on free exercise rights. It upheld them in terms of the old order Amish in the case of Wisconsin versus Yoda. But in other, other cases, it almost it routinely ruled against free exercise claims and ruled that the government could make people comply to, to, to valid secular regulations. The Roberts Court, quite different. The Roberts Court finally is a very much an accommodations court. In terms of establishment issues, it is likely to find that there isn't a violation of the non-establishment clause. But in free exercise cases, in contrast, it's very likely to rule in favor of the individual. Well, how has this happened? What's, what has happened in terms of, of, uh, of the court, of, and court in terms of this? And obviously what's happened has been in terms of the appointment process. People say the court is political, the court's always been political. I mean, you look back at Marbury versus Madison, John Marshall was a very good politician. He outmaneuvered Thomas Jefferson. That's politics. It's been politics from the beginning. The problem more recently is the court gets a lot more attention than it used to. And so its politics becomes more, more apparent. It also because Basically, since Richard Nixon campaign, successful campaign in 1968, most candidates for president have made the court a political issue. I mean, Bill Clinton is, is kind of the exception. He was able to kind of tone it down a little bit, but everyone else has made it. If you look at the, at the, the Trump election, uh, some people would suggest the thing that put Trump, Trump over the top, I mean, he didn't get the largest number of popular votes, but gotten the, the majority of the electoral college votes, was his commitment to change the Supreme Court. To, to appoint people basically who were stamped approval by the Federalist Society. It's changed the, the position of court dramatically. The Roberts course has changed the court's position, both in terms of free exercise and also in terms of the non-establishment. 
Well, just let's look at those developments for, for a minute. If you look at the free exercise clause, cases involving free exercise, uh, I think I've, uh, I've, I've done something to, Beth is going to not, is not, is going to not forgive me. Uh, I've, I've moved from one, jumped ahead of where I thought I was going to be. If you look at the, the this chart here, it shows you what has happened recently in terms of court appointments, the significance of changes. So if you, you start out there uh, with, with Justice Scalia, the change to Gorsuch, uh, the Ginsburg appointment, obviously to Barrett, some appointments have less impact. Uh, Blackman's replacement by, with Breyer didn't really change, change the court very much. I'd suggest to you that even though she hasn't voted yet in a case, that Justice Jackson's position is significantly different than Justice Bryan. The replacement of Kennedy by Kavanaugh didn't change the court that much, but some ones have changed the court even more. Uh, the, the next chart will show what I would suggest in terms of, of the most significant changes in terms of the court on this particular issue on free exercise and establishment. Clarence Thomas's replacement of, of, of Thurgood Marshall on a variety of issues, but clearly a, a very much on this one issue. White to Ginsburg. White, in terms of non-establishment cases, I don't think ever found a uh, challenge to the, uh, state law based on the establishment to, to be justified. Ginsburg, just almost the opposite. Uh, and of course, now Ginsburg's replacement by, by Justice Barrett. Whereas if you drop down to the bottom, uh, the difference between Rehnquist and Roberts was, is not that great, or Blackman to Breyer, Stevens to Kagan, or Scalia to Gorsuch, didn't matter in this area that much. Somewhat in between Kennedy to Kavanaugh, Breyer to Jackson, I'm suggesting might be greater. O'Connor definitely to Alito is a rather significant one. Well, let's look at some of the cases then for a second. Uh, we look at free exercise. The chart here from a alleged violation of the Constitution of Free Exercise Clause in Reynolds versus the United States. As I said before, uh, in that case, the court, Chief Justice White said, all the Free Exercise Clause protects is belief. You have the right to believe, but not to practice. And then he went into the argument of horrors, you know, if free exercise can be used to justify action, then you've got people, the thuggies in, in India, who thought it was a religious duty to beat someone up, the, the, the poor wife who's thrown on a funeral pyre, that types, these types of practices cannot be tolerated. The, these are not acceptable. It's only belief. Brown versus Brown, uh, it was a case involving uh, a Jewish haberdasher who closed his office, closed his store from sundown on Friday to sundown on Saturday, but the state law said he had to close it on Sunday as well. Court says, basically tough. I mean, you no. Know, how do you, but how do you run a, a men's store that's closed on the weekend? Not, they're not too sympathetic. If you drop down, however, you see with Carson versus Mackin, the case from Maine, Carson versus Mackin involved a, a practice that is, I think, unique to Northern New England, to Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. Uh, in some of these areas, the population is so small, the school districts can't maintain a high school. There's just no, there would be no basis for it. They can, they can run an elementary school, Maybe they can run a middle school, but they really can't run a high school. And so in those jurisdictions, the state of Maine, the state of New Hampshire and Vermont provide that the state will give you a certain amount of money, which will be sufficient to send you send your child to uh, say the, the high school in Bangor, Maine or the, or the high school in, in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, you can do that. Or you could send them to a private school. That that would be you know, up to the, they won't pay the entire tuition if it's more than the, than the fixed amount, but you can make up the difference, or in many cases, it would pay the entire thing. But the main law said you cannot use it to send your son or daughter to a religious school. Carson versus Macon challenged that. And the Supreme Court said, yeah, that is a violation of the free, of, of free exercise. That's discrimination against religion. In Kennedy versus Bremerton School District, Kennedy, the football coach, was told he shouldn't lead prayers uh, in the locker room. But instead of leading in the, in the locker room, at the end of the football game, Kennedy would go to, the, to midfield, kneel down, and lead a prayer. 
court said the way they've enforced this he's free to do what he wants during this period of time it's not during when he's required to do something he's he's required to have the the uh, consultation or pep talk with his team before the game uh, he has to be there obviously but after the game's over we don't have any rules as to what he can or cannot do and to to discipline him to fire him uh for doing this on his quote unquote free time that is a violation of free exercise Th that that's uh, those last two decisions are rather dramatic decisions uh, in terms of free exercise the same dramatic change can be found in terms of the establishment clause and the court's ruling in terms of what is a violation of the establishment clause the the first case there the church of the holy trinity versus the united states is the is justice brewer's opinion saying this is a christian nation that's a, obviously uh in terms of establishment seem to be a, to most of us a violation of the establishment clause but then you drop down the lemon versus kurtzman that's unconstitutional uh committee versus nyquist was a, a program by which uh, people in in new york could take get a basically a tax credit or tax deduction that was found unconstitutional but then you go up to the most recent case there the case of zelman versus simmons harris that's constitutional and what it involves is essentially a voucher system the court finds that's now constitutional uh, in the in just in the past four years four states most recently florida have come up with, with voucher systems that's a dramatic change in terms of the establishment clause just as dramatic change in terms of free exercise and despite that these changes by the roberts court by the rencourt's court basically seem to be to be under the radar they don't get much attention at all what has caused them to change well, let's go back to to the changes in terms of the court the court today is clearly divided between republicans and democrats it very much very very much is is divided into two, two blocks there's really very little swing it, it's interesting in terms of, of the case of these cases in terms of of free exercise and establishment of religion well connor and kennedy are quite correctly seen as swing justices i mean they're where they voted in terms of abortion tended to decide where it would go and many other issues but on on this issue they are really part of the reason the court has moved from the separationist quadrant and the secularist quadrant, quadrant to the accommodation they've pulled it off they have pulled it off along with Alito, Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Roberts. We now clearly have an accommodationist majority. Well, again, to, to ask the question I asked before, why doesn't this get more attention? Why did the decisions uh, in Carson versus Macon and Kennedy versus Bremerton, why didn't they get more attention? Uh, okay, abortion and guns, they swallow up or they sucked up a lot of the oxygen. But you know, with the 24 hour news circle, you'd think these would have got some attention. They just didn't. I think a lot of the credit for this has to be given to Chief Justice Roberts. The Roberts Court has the lowest record for overturning precedents, despite the Dobbs decision involving Roe. The lowest rate of overturning precedents since the 1940s. It's been able to pull this off. I mean, there's a good deal of speculation more recently that, in terms of the Dobbs opinion, had the 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 opinion, the elite opinion, not been leaked, Roberts might have been able to persuade Kavanaugh and Barrett to come on his side and not overturn Roe and Casey. He would have been able to uphold the, the challenge law with the 15, uh, 15 week regulation in terms of abortion, but he would have done it so very quietly. That's what he's pulled off in terms of these issues. He's been able to keep the controversy muted, despite the fact there's been a dramatic change. I mean, that's quite a, that's quite a trip. That's quite a tribute to John Roberts, the institutionalist that he's been able to bring about these these huge changes without upsetting everyone some people obviously are upset 
the, the descending justices, uh, Kagan and Sotomayor, uh, and I'm sure Duke Jackson, uh, will, are quite, will be quite upset or are quite, have been quite upset, but he's able to pull it off. But well, how's he been doing? He's been doing it with the standard of neutrality. I mean, the court's positions in terms of free exercise, it's, it's tests for free exercise have changed. It's tests in terms of what is a violation of the establishment clause have changed. But the one thing, the one term that runs through all the opinions, it goes back to Everson versus Board of Education, to Justice Black's opinion in, in Everson versus Board of Education. Black wrote, the First Amendment requires the states to be neutral in its relation with groups of religious believers and non-believers. It does not require the state to be their adversary. State power is no more to be used so as to handicap religion than it is to favor them. This idea of neutrality appears in another important establishment clause case, Abington Township versus Shemp, the school prayer decision written by Justice Tom Clark. Writes to Clark, the wholesome neutrality of which the court's cases speak thus stems from a recognition of the teachings of history that powerful sex might bring about a fusion of government and religious functions to the end that official support would be placed behind the tenets of one or all orthodoxy. This the establishment clause forbids. And a further reason for neutrality is found in the free exercise clause, which recognizes the right of every person to freely choose his own course with reference thereto, free of any compulsion from the state. Neutrality also appeared in the decision by Chief Justice Berger in the case of Lemon versus Kurtzman. In that, he stated the neutrality required by the religion clause, clauses, observed Berger, would pose diff great difficulty for a dedicated religious person remaining religiously neutral as required by the Constitution. The same idea of neutrality continues in the more recent cases. It's mentioned in Carson, it's, in, in term, it's mentioned in terms of, of Kennedy. But what gives? How can, how can they all be using the term neutrality and come into diametrically opposed decisions, whether in terms of free exercise or in terms of establishment? Well, I like to go to, go to a great American philosopher, or at least Justice Felix Frankfurter called Finley Peter Dunn a great philosopher. Finley Peter Dunn, for those who who are not Irish, uh, was the man who created the publican, Mr. Dooley. Mr. Dooley is the one who said, yeah, whether the constitution follows the, the, the flag or not is an important issue. But the fact is the Supreme Court follows the election returns. He also had another little conversation with, with one of his customers, Mr. Hennessy, about neutrality. Hennessy said, I, I read by the paper that we're to be neutral. But what, do, what, do we, what does that mean? Well, that's a good question, Mr. Dooley said. The question is, for whom are we to be neutral for? Well, the question is, for whom are we to be neutral? What does neutrality mean? What, benevolent neutrality? That's a term that Chief Justice Berger and Justice White used in the Wallace versus Jaffrey case. Wallace versus Jaffrey was the case involving an Alabama statute, which provided not just for a moment of silent meditation, which is constitutional, but a moment of silent meditation or prayer. The court said, speaking through Justice O'Connor, that's an endorsement of religion. So it's unconstitutional. But Berger said there should be a benevolent neutrality. That is not offended by this. He dissented along with Justice Byron White. Justice Rehnquist not only dissented, but our, they, put forth a very different position or maybe a better definition of what White and Berger meant by benevolent neutrality. According to, in his dissent, the Lone Ranger observed that the establishment clause did not require government neutrality between religion and irreligion, nor did it prohibit the federal government from providing non-discriminatory aid to religion. That's a very different new notion of neutrality. Neutrality also appears in Justice Scalia's opinion in employment diversion versus Smith. In that case, Scalia argued, Supreme Court decisions have consistently held the right of free exercise does not relieve an individual of the obligation to comply with a valid and neutral law of general applicability. If it's not neutral, it's unconstitutional. 
So Scalia, while he found no violation of the free exercise clause in denying Smith and Black unemployment compensation, did find a violation of the free exercise clause in a subsequent case, a case coming after employment division, which, which involved the Santorians. The Santorians were a group of people who came over from Cuba. Fidel Castro opened up the prisons. A lot of Cubans arrived. They were a very different group of people. They were not the Bacardi rum crew. This is a very different group of people that come around. And some of them practice the Santorian religion, which is essentially a blend of Catholicism and certain African religions. A part of its religious practice was the sacrifice of animals. People in Hialeah, Florida said their little dogs and cats were going missing. They thought the Santorians were behind it. And so they passed an ordinance which said that the sacri ritual sacrifice of animals is not protected. But again, they had to be careful here because otherwise they would have involved the kosher butcher. They didn't want to do that. So they designed the law that if you sacrificed animals, religious slaughtering animals, that was okay if it was for meat consumption, but not if it wasn't. In other words, they designed the law to to target one particular group, an unpopular group, the Supreme Court says that's unconstitutional. It's that standard, that idea that you see in, in this case that has risen up in more recent cases in terms of free exercise. Whether we're calling about Masterpiece Bake Shop, there the court said that the Colorado Civil Rights Commission wasn't neutral. They, they disparaged the, the, the views of, of anyone who was not in favor of same-sex marriage. Therefore, they're not neutral. A case coming out of Philadelphia, where the city of Philadelphia uh, terminated the contract with Catholic Social Services to look after foster children. Again, the court said they were not neutral because they were allowed certain exceptions. Why couldn't the Catholic Social Services get that exception? The case in, in terms of Maine, Carson versus Macon. Again, why this one exception? What's the reason for cutting religious schools out? You allow other private schools. That's certainly not like the other public schools. I mean, if I were a real estate agent in rural Maine, uh, I'd say, hey, you want to send your son or daughter to Phillips Exeter or Phillips Andover or Groton? Come to Maine. You can commute. You can telecommute. And the state of Maine will give you $15,000 toward the tuition. The court says what Maine is doing is not neutral. In the recent, in the cases, the two cases before the court right now, the, the one case is the case involving creative services, the, 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 the website designed for, for weddings. The court has said, we're only gonna decide this on speech grounds, which is, which is the, the woman claims that religious reason, uh, people have speculated why they're not taking it as, uh, as a religion case. It, it certainly falls under employment diversion versus Smith, I mean, as if you go back to the employment division versus Smith standard, if you have free exercise with another claim, in this case, free speech, then you, you invoke the compelling state interest as of Sherbet or the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which is a very tough standard for a government to, to overcome. I, I'd suggest maybe because they don't want to, to firm up employment division versus Smith anymore, just like Lemon versus Kurtzman, these are essentially to use a religious terms. These are whitened sepulchers. They haven't been overturned, but don't depend on either of them as, as important precedents. The other case that's before the court is the case of uh, Groff versus DeJoy, which involves the issue under civil rights legislation of making a reasonable accommodation to people's religious practices. DeJoy is the, is the postmaster general, or rather sometimes controversial postmaster general. Groff uh, does not want to work on Sunday. Uh, post office, I don't know whether you, about your mailman, but uh, th there's a shortage of mailman uh, and Amazon is sending a lot of the packages through the US post office. Uh, uh, Groff says, I don't want to work on Sunday. Well, the postmaster in the small town says, I've got no one else to work on Sunday. We, we've got all these boxes coming in from Amazon. We have to move them. Uh, Sorry, if you don't work on Sunday, you're fired. Is that is that an undue burden? If to give him to to give Groff Sundays off, is that an undue burden? Again, the court will will decide this. Most of the betting in terms of creative services from the argument in terms of free speech is that Colorado is going to lose again. That creative services will win. 
that uh, it is what she's involved in is speech. Government cannot censor your speech, cannot tell you what to write or not. The oral arguments, if, you, if it's predictive, she's going, to, she's going to win. These cases will keep coming. And they're coming before, as I said, a very different court, a very much an accommodationist court, one that is not likely to strike down legislation based on the establishment clause. I mean, Maine claimed uh, that what they, were, what they were being forced to do or what, what uh, Carson wanted was to violate the establishment clause. The court said, no, no, it's, it is not a violation of the establishment clause. What you're doing is a violation of free exercise. In Kennedy, again, the same thing. It is not neutral. You can't do that. This is, as I say, a very different court. And the cases are going to keep coming. There are two cases from the Ninth Circuit. One case involving the San, the San Jose School District, which decertified a student group called the, I think it's the Federation of, of, of Fellowship of Christian Athletes. They were decertified as a group. Uh, they claim, well, this is a violation of their rights. The, there is an equal access law which Congress passed that violates that. But they said it's also violating because they were targeted. Uh, the, the teachers said that their opposition to same-sex marriage uh, exposed them as charlatans. Uh, this showed that the government was not, was not neutral. Uh, there's another case from the, the Ninth Circuit that might make it to the Supreme Court, which would be, might be even more interesting, casing, a case involving uh, Apache Stronghold versus the United States. It involves uh, the desire by uh, the, in the state of, of Arizona to exploit a, a big copper reserve, but it's an area that the, the Apaches see as a religious area. Uh, the United States government is saying, the Biden administration is saying, uh, sorry, uh, they can drill, it's going to be interesting again how a court which is now more sympathetic to free exercise and has as one of its members, Justice Gorsuch, who is uh, kind of an expert on, on Native American law, how the court's going to react to that one. Things are different. Uh, it's an area that keeps being controversial. Uh, by choosing to, to work on this area, I, I'm working on a, a gold vein that doesn't seem to be uh, dying out. It will keep, it's the gift that keeps giving. We will continue to have controversies as to what is free exercise, what is establishment, how far can government go, how far can government be restrained. <laughs>